Welcome to Passionate Reply, and welcome to Great Albums. While I don't often discuss shorter works like EPs in this format, I'll be making an exception in the case of Futurisk's Player Piano, first released in 1982. The main reason I've chosen to highlight Player Piano is that it's the closest thing to a full-length release that Futurisk ever got to make. They were a remarkably short-lived outfit defunct by the mid-1980s after releasing only Player Piano in 82 and one 7-inch single in 1980. Time. The ostensible A-side of Futurisk's lone single, What We Have to Have, is perhaps the track that most betrays their obvious influences. Clocking in at exactly two minutes and jumping right into the fray, What We Have to Have is a perfect punk song, right down to the way vocalist Jeremy Colazine skips right over those H's like a smooth stone on a still pond. Despite the perhaps overbearing British influence on their work, Futurisk actually hailed from America, South Florida to be precise. In a lot of ways, it's perhaps unsurprising that their days numbered so short. Both brashly neurotic synth as well as punk qua punk were enjoying their brief moments of wider popularity in the early 80s, and those flickers of interest proved even shorter among American audiences. While it's easy to imagine a more traditional version of what we have to have, dispensing with the electronics in favor of guitars, the single's flip side, Army Now, is a track that I think really uniquely benefits from its infusion of synthesizer sensibility. Time and more complex structures and textures, Army Now is a work that feels a bit more substantial than what we have to have, but it retains a lot of the lovably punk aggression and vitriol of the A side. Though what we have to have is a bit more bubbly musically, the two tracks share a certain sense of irony. It's particularly affecting on Army Now, which is almost like a depraved hymn to the horrors of war, sung by a zealous victim of propaganda. As I suggested earlier, I think the use of electronics really pushes this track over the top, reminding us of how increasingly sophisticated technology has resulted in increasingly devastating armed conflicts. Its sudden and frightening synth blasts seem to portray missiles whistling in the air and then exploding. 
but I also can't neglect the vocals on this track, which seem to grow progressively fractured, almost quavering on later repetitions of its refrain, as though the veil of propaganda is finally shattering for its narrator. With that out of the way, let's get into how Futurisk expanded upon these ideas for their second and final release, the EP Player Piano. Tall figure at the core of Meteorite is implied to be a spy, with her pillow talk overtly compared to propaganda, which makes the track feel cut from a similar cloth as Army now in terms of its pervasive Cold War paranoia. But this interpretation is by no means necessary to enjoy Meteorite. It, and Player Piano as a whole, are arguably geared more towards a synth pop direction with less guitar and more emphasis on bright and rather hooky synth lines. While a certain aura of punk attitude still remains here, it's also quite possible to appreciate Meteorite as simply a great minimal synth tune. The Femme Fatale theme seems to have been one Futurist we're somewhat invested in, given that they tackled it once again on another player piano track, Poison Ivy. Despite having a similar theme to Meteorite, Poison Ivy seems to take it in a fairly different musical direction. Where Meteorite seeks to dominate our attention with its siren-like synths, Poison Ivy is lighter and more playful. While the subject of Meteorite comes across as genuinely threatening and ominous, the title character of Poison Ivy could be interpreted as simply flirtatious and only dangerous in a metaphorical and unserious fashion. It's also worth noting that she's a named character, albeit with a tongue-in-cheek epithet, whereas the subject of Meteorite is never truly given a name. I think this choice makes Poison Ivy feel more like ribbing somebody familiar, and Meteorite a bit more like describing something eldritch and unknown. While Poison Ivy is only a bit over the two-minute mark, it still manages to fit in a rather compelling instrumental bridge, hinting at a level of musicianship in Futurist that perhaps belies their allegiance to down-and-dirty punk song structures in some of their other work. Another track that seems to highlight this side of the group is the lone instrumental player piano, and hence their entire career, Push Me, Pull You. With a striking use of ABA form, it feels like the track on the EP with the most ambitions beyond pop.
The cover design for Player Piano is fairly minimalistic, featuring a streaking shooting star and a somewhat on-the-nose reference to the aforementioned track Meteorite. Above this device, we see the name of the group written in a prototypical Space Age typeface, with letters arranged in varying heights against the backdrop of five horizontal lines, perhaps suggestive of musical notation. With its simplistic black and orange color scheme, Player Piano's cover appropriates mid-century modernist graphic design, much like many other underground artists were doing at the time. I'm tempted to compare this one in particular to the iconic art for the Human League single Being Boiled, which also made heavy use of this lurid, burnished orange color. The album's title is a reference to one of the earliest electromechanical musical instruments, the player piano or pianola. Player pianos were essentially pianos that played themselves. They were fed programming of music to play on perforated sheets, not unlike early computing punch cards. Peaking in popularity in the 1920s, the player piano was often used as a metaphor for the increasing automation of human life, particularly for the poignancy of how it replaced the creative and interpretive work of a performing musician. I think Futurist's use of the term shows a certain self-deprecating sensibility about their use of synthesizers. While music synthesizers of the kind they used are much more complex creative tools than player pianos, there remains a stigma surrounding them as inferior instruments or tools that remove the human element from the creation of music. As I mentioned earlier, Futurist's career was extremely short, and they never managed to produce any sort of follow-up to player piano. Not even a 21st century reunion album as many rediscovered stars of minimal synth would eventually get to do. Futurist's musical Afterlife began in the year 2010, when an expanded re-release of Player Piano became the 23rd release on Veronika Vashichka's influential Minimal Wave record label, which specializes in resurrecting hidden gems of early electronic music. Besides simply being more available and readily accessible, Minimal Wave's version of the album is essentially a complete compilation of all of Futurisk's work, including the tracks from their original 7-inch single as well as some earlier, rougher cuts of the same tracks. Given that this is a band whose entire discography can be taken in an under an hour, I'd recommend listening to this if you're at all curious about the group. Even though I personally prefer the more polished versions of the songs, the more raw cuts are still extremely interesting for comparison. My personal favorite track on Player Piano is Lonely Streets. Earlier, I argued that the EP as a whole seems pushed in more of a synth-pop direction, and I think this track is probably the closest Futurist ever really came to that ideal. The protagonist of Lonely Streets is not quite the femme fatale of Meteorite and Poison Ivy, but rather a somewhat distant and mysterious figure admired from afar. That's everything for today. Thanks for listening.
And Avenue 